Okay, so you know how we're always talking about the brain and behavior, right? Well, you get this. What if I told you that the brains of children exposed to violence actually react kind of like the brains of combat soldiers? Yeah, that's a pretty powerful parallel, right? And it's exactly what researchers dove into in this 2011 article from Current Biology. Oh, wow. 2011. That's a while back. So this research has been out there for a bit. It has. And it's yeah. really fascinating. The article's called uh, Maltreated Children Show the Same Pattern of Brain Activity as Combat Soldiers. Okay. So we've got this research. Mm. And what we really want to unpack today is what it tells us about how childhood experiences, especially those involving violence, can shape brain development. Right, because we all know that childhood is such a critical period for brain development. But this study really takes it a step further. So how do they even study this? Okay. How do you measure brain activity in children who've experienced violence? That's where the fMRI comes in. Oh, the fMRI, that's the big brain scanner, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. It allows researchers to see brain activity in real time, and that's precisely what they did in this study. So like a window into the brain. Exactly. They had a group of 43 children, some who had been exposed to family violence and others who hadn't. Okay, so two groups to compare. Right. And they put these kids in the fMRI scanner and showed them images of faces with different expressions like sad, calm, and angry. And they were looking for what exactly? Changes in brain activity, I'm guessing? You got it. They were particularly interested in two specific brain areas the anterior insula, and the amygdala. Hold on, I've heard those names before. Aren't those areas involved in, like, processing emotions and stuff? Bingo. The amygdala is kind of like our brain's alarm system. It kicks into gear when it senses a threat. Makes sense. And the anterior insula plays a role in a bunch of things, including our awareness of our body's internal state and how we experience emotions. Okay, so these are pretty important areas, especially when it comes to responding to danger or threats. Right. And here's the kicker. The researchers found that in the children who had been exposed to violence, these two areas, the anterior insula and the amygdala were much more active when they saw the angry faces compared to the kids who hadn't experienced that kind of violence. So basically their brains were like on high alert, even just seeing an angry face. Exactly. And it gets even more interesting because this pattern of heightened activity in the anterior insula and amygdala is something that's also been observed in soldiers who've experienced combat. Wow, so you're saying their brains are reacting in a similar way to a situation that's perceived as threatening. That's the idea. It seems like both the soldiers and the children who've been exposed to violence have developed this kind of hypervigilance. Hypervigilance. So, like, they're constantly on edge scanning for danger. Right. Their brains have adapted to be extra sensitive to potential threats, which makes sense in a dangerous environment. Like a survival mechanism. Exactly. It's like their brains are trying to protect them. But here's the thing. Okay. I'm all ears. This constant state of high alert can come at a cost. Like what kind of cost? Well, those same brain areas, the anterior insula and the amygdala, are also implicated in anxiety disorders. Uh, oh, so this hypervigilance could actually make them more prone to anxiety later on. That's what this research suggests. It's like their brains are wired for survival, but that wiring might also make them more vulnerable to certain mental health challenges. So even if a child seems okay on the surface, there could be this underlying vulnerability brewing. And that's what makes these findings so important because it highlights the potential long-term consequences of childhood trauma, even if there aren't any obvious symptoms in the present. That's pretty heavy stuff. It is, and what's even more striking is that all the children in this study were considered healthy at the time of the research. So no outward signs of any problem. Right, but their brains were telling a different story, suggesting that these changes in brain activity represent a potential risk factor for developing anxiety and other mental health issues down the line. Look at hidden vulnerability. Exactly, and it underscores the need to understand the long-term impact of childhood experiences on brain development. Okay, so... We've established that exposure to violence can have this lasting impact on a child's brain. But what about the kids who don't develop any issues? I mean, not every child exposed to violence ends up with anxiety or other problems, right? Absolutely. That's a really important point. And in fact, the lead researcher on this study, Dr. Eamon McCrory, emphasized that not all children exposed to violence go on to develop mental health problems. Some children show remarkable resilience. Okay, so there's hope. There is, and that brings up a whole other set of questions for researchers. Like, what makes some kids resilient? What's their secret? Exactly. What factors contribute to resilience? And how stable are these brain changes over time? These are all questions that scientists are still exploring. I can see how understanding resilience would be a game changer. It could lead to new ways to help kids who've experienced trauma. Absolutely. It's a crucial area of research and one that holds a lot of promise for the future. This is fascinating stuff. 
We're going to need to take a break here, but when we come back, let's dive deeper into what this research means for how we approach child protection and early intervention. Yeah. All right, so we've been talking about these brain changes and how exposure to violence can actually affect the way a child's brain develops. Right, and we touched on the idea of resilience, how some kids seem to bounce back from these experiences while others struggle more. Exactly, and I'm really curious about the real world implications of all this. Yeah. Like what does this research mean for things like child protection and early intervention? Well, that's where things start to get really interesting because this research has the potential to completely change how we think about these issues. Okay, I'm all ears. If we know that these brain changes are happening, even in kids who might seem outwardly healthy. Right, like they might not be showing any obvious signs of problems. Exactly. Then what can we do to intervene early on and potentially prevent those long-term mental health issues? Yeah, it's like we need to redefine what healthy means in these cases. It's not just about whether a child is exhibiting symptoms right now, but also about recognizing that there could be this underlying vulnerability that needs to be addressed. You hit the nail on the head. And that's precisely why this research is so crucial. It provides us with a biological basis for understanding the impact of childhood trauma. So it's not just about psychology or behavior anymore. It's like we're seeing the physical evidence of trauma in the brain. Exactly. And that understanding can help us develop more effective prevention and treatment strategies. Okay. So it's not just about removing a child from a dangerous environment. It sounds like we need to provide ongoing support to help them cope with those neurological changes that might have already occurred. You got it. And that support might look different than traditional therapy. How so? Well, it might involve interventions that are specifically targeted at regulating those key brain regions we talked about, the anterior insula and the amygdala. Ah, uh, right, because those are the areas that are so sensitive to threat and fear. Exactly. And there are techniques that can help calm those overactive brain regions. Like what kind of techniques? Things like mindfulness exercises, breathing techniques, and other strategies that can help kids manage their stress response and develop better emotional regulation skills. It's like we're helping them rewire their brains in a more positive direction. Precisely. But we also need to remember those resilient kids. Right. What makes them tick? If we can figure out what helps them bounce back, maybe we can replicate those protective factors for other children. Exactly. And while it's probably a complex combination of genetics, environment, and individual experiences, there is some research suggesting that strong social support networks play a huge role. So having a loving family or strong community ties can make a big difference. It seems so. And positive role models and healthy coping mechanisms like the mindfulness and emotional regulation we talked about are also key. It's like we're building a buffer against the negative effects of trauma. Precisely. And that's where early intervention becomes so incredibly important. Because if we can catch these kids early on and give them those protective factors. Exactly. The support, the coping skills, the positive relationships. Then we can potentially change the whole trajectory of their lives. It's a powerful idea, isn't it? That we can intervene and help these kids build resilience even in the face of adversity. It really is. This whole conversation just highlights how... Childhood trauma isn't something that just disappears. Mm. It has a real and lasting impact on the developing brain, and we need to take that seriously. Absolutely, and those brain changes can affect more than just mental health. Really? In what way? Well, think about it. If a child is constantly on high alert, worried about potential threats, it's going to be much harder for them to focus in school, make friends, and just enjoy being a kid. It's like they're carrying this invisible weight around with them. Exactly. And that can have implications for their academic performance, their social development, their overall well-being. This is serious stuff. Mm -hmm. We're not just talking about some minor inconvenience. Mm -hmm. This is about a child's ability to thrive and reach their full potential. You're absolutely right, and that's why this research is such a wake-up call for all of us. A wake-up call to do what? To be more aware of the impact of childhood trauma and to do everything we can to create environments that foster resilience and well-being. So it's not just about the kids themselves. It's about creating supportive communities and families where kids feel safe and loved. Exactly. We need a societal shift in how we think about and address childhood trauma. It's not just a problem for social workers or therapists to deal with. It's something we all need to be concerned about. It sounds like we need a multi-pronged approach. Research intervention, prevention, societal change. It's a well, tall order. It is, but I believe that with continued research, advocacy, and action, we can make a real difference in the lives of children. We can create a world where all children have the opportunity to thrive regardless of their early experiences. That's a powerful vision. <laughs> now I'm ready for the final part of our deep dive. 
Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here. Yeah. Talk about how early childhood exposure to violence can actually change a child's brain. And how those changes can really impact their mental and emotional well-being even years down the road. But we've also talked about this idea of resilience, how some kids seem to be able to bounce back from these experiences. Right, and understanding what drives that resilience is so important, it could hold the key to helping other kids who are struggling. Exactly. But knowing all this, like, where do we even begin to address it? What can we actually do to protect kids and intervene early? Well, it starts with taking this research seriously. You know, moving beyond just acknowledging the problem and really shifting our focus towards creating solutions. Solutions, okay. So what would that look like? Well, for one, it means investing in early intervention programs that really work. We need to be able to identify those kids who might be at risk because of exposure to violence. So we can give them the support they need early on. Exactly. Help them develop healthy coping mechanisms and build that resilience we were talking about. Okay, so things like therapy counseling, maybe parenting support programs. Absolutely. Those are all critical. But we also need to think bigger, you know, more broadly about what kids and families need. Like, what do you mean? Well, think about community-based programs, mentorship initiatives, even things like school-based interventions that focus on social-emotional learning. So it's not just about addressing the trauma directly. It's about building a supportive environment for kids in all areas of their lives. Exactly. It's about creating this kind of safety net that can catch kids and families before they fall through the cracks. I like that analogy, a safety net. Mm. And part of creating that safety net, I imagine, is changing societal attitudes, right? Absolutely. We need communities that are more supportive of families, especially those who are facing challenges. So what kind of changes are we talking about? Well, things like affordable child care, access to quality mental health services and reducing the stigma around seeking help. Mm. You know, parents need to feel comfortable asking for help without feeling ashamed or judged. It's about removing those barriers so families don't feel alone in their struggles. Exactly. And of course, we can't forget about the legal and policy side of things. Right. Because there are laws in place to protect children. And those laws need to be strong, adequately enforced. And we need to provide the resources for law enforcement and social service agencies to effectively intervene when there's abuse or neglect happening. So it's a system wide issue that requires a system wide response. But what about us as individuals? Like, what can we do, even if we're not directly involved in child protection or social work? You know, that's a great question. And the truth is, there's a lot we can do. It all starts with awareness. So educating ourselves about the impact of childhood trauma. Exactly. The more we understand about it, the more likely we are to recognize the signs and know when to take action. So being informed, being vigilant, what else? Well, we can support organizations that are working to prevent child abuse and neglect. You know, volunteer our time donate to charities, or even just speak out against violence and advocate for policies that protect children. It's a reminder that even small actions can make a difference. They really can. And I think the most important thing is to just be kind and compassionate. Create supportive communities where everyone feels safe and understood. I love that. It all comes back to kindness. It really does. If we all do our part, we can create a world where all children have the opportunity to thrive and reach their full potential regardless of their early experiences. Wow, this has been an incredible deep dive. We've learned so much about the impact of childhood trauma on the developing brain, the importance of resilience, and what we can do to create a more supportive environment for kids and families. It's been a really thought-provoking conversation, and I hope our listeners are walking away with a better understanding of this complex issue. Me too. Before we wrap up, I just want to leave our listeners with one final thought. Hmm. You know, we've been talking about science and research, but at the end of the day, this is about real children with real lives. That's such an important point. These aren't just statistics or data points. They're human beings who need our compassion, understanding, and support. Absolutely. Every child deserves the chance to have a happy and healthy life. Well said. And on that note, we'll wrap up this deep dive. Thanks for joining us. It's been an honor to explore this important topic with you. The pleasure was all mine. And to our listeners, remember that knowledge is power. Now that you've taken this deep dive, use what you've learned to make a difference in the lives of children. Even small actions can create a brighter future for them.